and welcome to everybody. I'm glad to have such a, a good group today. I see, uh, see lots of familiar faces, and it's good to it's good to see you all, and hopefully impart some some good information so you can kind of know kind of the lay of the land on this whole corporate transparency act and and how we think things are going to roll forward and what what you as a business owner who probably has to report at some point um, needs to do. Um, and as you said, we're really happy that uh, Tim Terry has joined us. Uh, Tim is the is the general counsel for Hearts Capital. He's been really active in organizations uh, like the Private Investors Coalition and others that have have, that have followed this view, this issue carefully for a long time, even before it was the law. And since it's been the law, and and it, it's really good to have Tim as a as an ally and friend and an expert on this issue and willing to join us today. Um, so first, I guess a little bit of background. We're gonna keep, as I said before, I'm gonna keep this informal. Uh, Tim and I are gonna have a little bit of a conversation, and then we'll try to, to turn to your your questions. But it's useful, I think, to sort of have the lay of the land here. Uh, the Corporate Transparency Act passed at the very end of the Trump administration as part of a much bigger bill. Uh, and uh, I we we up and talk to members of Congress now, and most of them don't even. You know, they don't remember it, that it, they, they weren't sure if they voted for it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, kind of discouraging, but that is what it is. Um, and uh, but what it does is it record, re requires uh, virtually every entity in the country to report uh, first initially on their so-called beneficial owners and report some pretty detailed personal information about those folks, where they live, things like driver's license, passport numbers, that sort of thing. And then to keep all that information updated uh, forever uh, in, a, in a timely way under threat of significant fines and potential imprisonment uh, for failing to do so. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty significant thing. It only affects small companies, 20 employees and fewer, $5 million in revenue and fewer. There are some exemptions to that, which we'll talk about, I think. But in the main, the vast majority of small entities have to do this reporting. We have uh, and, and no end of concerns about that um, in terms of the practical implications mm -hmm. for small companies, their investors, uh, their employees, and, and all the rest that we'll, that we'll get into. Um, and uh, not only that, but we, we're, we're pretty concerned that this is not even a, a, a legal uh, law. So NSB actually has filed suit in federal court, um, basically making the case that Congress doesn't have the authority under the Constitution to enact this, because these are the uh, incorporations are, are left to the states. Uh, they're, they're asking for information essentially for criminal proceedings before there's been any charge of a crime without any kind of a warrant. That's not allowed by the Constitution. And, and, there, and there's a much longer list of, of concerns as well uh, in the suit that, that we'll go to. We don't have a ruling yet. Um, we filed this over a year ago. There are oral arguments back in November. We expect a, a, um, a ruling literally any day, but we've been saying that for about six weeks now. So we're, we really are hopeful it will be, it will be any day. Um, but that's kind of where things stand. Uh, there's, uh, there, are, there is some uh, legislation on the Hill. We have gotten pretty good attention now from folks on, on the Hill, and there's some legislation in the House and the Senate to delay the implementation of this. We would like it to make it go away entirely, but, but, but they at least there seems to be broad bipartisan support for, for delay. So we're hopeful we can piece together the same language in both the House and the Senate and, and at least get this pushed back a little bit, but, but we will see. I wouldn't assume that if I were you. Um, so that's, that's kind of where things stand. Uh, I, I got to say, uh, Tim, every time I talk to a group of small business owners who, and mostly they don't know about this yet when I talk to them, and I tell them about it, and they're just dumbfounded that this is a thing, that they're being required to do this. And they want to know, how did this happen? How are we behind the eight ball? How did this come to be? So, I mean, I mean, I watched it happen too. You were there. Why are we yeah. facing this? Why did this get so much support in Congress? Um, well, so um, let's start with what the purpose of the CTA is. You know, the, the law enforcement the Department of Treasury, um, federal and state law enforcement agencies, international law enforcement, they're all trying to stop money laundering and terrorist financing. And um, so there have been numerous developments on the international level um, through the uh, FATF, which is the financial, I forget what exactly what it some stands for, financial um, task force. It's an international task force, ta uh, task force of 
of agency heads from countries uh, or allies around the world. And they all came together and said, this is what we need to do to stop terrorism financing, the money, the money laundering. And one of the recommendations in that task force report is to develop beneficial ownership registries in every country. So in this, so several years ago, the UK adopted their, their registry, which is a public registry. So when you submit your information in the UK, it's actually public. Um, the European Union also had a public registry. Um, I've been working with some lawyers in the European Union, and they actually sued the Euro in the European Court to saying that was a violation of privacy rights. They won that suit, and so the European Union registry is now in flux because the court said basically uh, it cannot be public. You're, that's an invasion of privacy. So they have to go back and kind of rejigger what they put in place. So this has been emanating for years. And in the U.S., the discussion around public or, or, or beneficial ownership registries has been going on for like 20 to 30 years, if not more. Um, but it all came to a head um, in the last five to eight years, five to 10 years, because in my view, um, Congress adopted uh, what's called the customer due diligence rule in 2015 and started or 16 and started implementing it in 2018. And what that did is it required banks and fi other financial institutions to collect beneficial ownership information when someone opened an account with the institution. So we all know, yes, you're all business owners. So when you open your bank accounts, you have to provide a passport, a driver's license, your home address. Um, and if you have layered entities, you have to provide information about the ownership entity that owns the operating business that has the account, or if you have a trust that owns the business that then has the bank account, you know, it all flows through to the ultimate beneficial owners of whoever owns the bank account. And so the banks started, had this huge compliance obligation associated with the CDD rule, and they've been bitching and complaining about it ever since it went into effect. And so what happened in 2021 is you had the confluence of events of the banks having five years of this annoyance in their minds of having to collect all this information and keep it on file so that the federal so the law enforcement authorities could request it with a subpoena, by the way, um, uh, if they needed it. Um, and so the banks are basically saying, this is too much. We don't want to do it. There has to be a better way. So the banks got on board with the CTA. You also had the consumer groups who just want transparency, regardless of, of uh, whether there's any rational basis to uh, have privacy. Um, and then you had law enforcement that just wants all the information they can get, and they want a database that they can search and track people and do all this other stuff. And so that all came together in the middle of the night, and they attached it to the Defense Authorization Act in 2021 that uh, was originally uh, vetoed by President Trump, uh, but then Congress overrode the veto um, and it became law at the end of 2021. So, and it was, and the CTA was attached to the Defense Authorization Act without the normal legislative process. So there were no hearings on it. There was no notice that it was happening. It was just an agreement by uh, the leadership and it's bipartisan. There's there is broad bipartisan support for its enactment, and that's ultimately what happened. But my personal view is that it really got legs when um, when the banks got on board. the 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 primary opponent to the CTA forever was the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and as many of you know, the chamber is basically dominated by the big banks. Um, and so once the banks got on board with the CTA, the chamber's opposition went away and they were able to get, they were able to kind of sneak it through the process uh, without us. We, we really didn't, like nobody knew it happened until after it happened uh, practically. So uh, that's why we ended up where we are. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a sad story. So um, I, I guess that's, that's, that's where we, that's how we got here, but uh, you know the, the questions that we get from small businesses all the time is what should we be doing? What should they be doing now? I mean, there's a couple of deadlines, yeah. right? That one's already come and gone. Well, not gone, right. but it's come for uh, new businesses. There's another one next year for existing businesses. How do you think companies should be? What should they be doing right now? How should they be preparing? Yeah. So there's a couple issues. Uh, one is the law is incredibly complicated. 
it's not it's not um ownership for purposes of beneficial ownership reporting under the act isn't what we who've been in the corporate world traditionally have thought of as ownership which is or even control which is right. ownership is equity in essence and control is who has control in the governance documents of the entity right throw those out the window they they just don't apply in this case the definitions that the cta has and and through the final rule um adopt brand new definitions of ownership not necessarily not so much ownership but uh control uh there that i've been practicing corporate law for over for almost 25 years and um nothing in this definition is rooted in traditional legal or regulatory understandings of of control um so it's a whole new definition and this is where people are going to get trapped by this statute and we'll get into some of the details in a little bit. But what you need to know now are the following. You're ex you have to start with the basic premise that every entity is a reporting company under the statute, unless you satisfy one of the exemptions. There are 23 exemptions under the statute. 22 of them apply to either regulated entities or regulated industries or and nonprofits. If you're not one of those, uh, there's only one exemption that you potentially qualify for, which is what they call the large operating uh, entity um, um, exemption. And to satisfy that, you have to have more than 20 full-time employees and more than $5 million in gross revenue annually. And you that entity has to have filed a tax return in the, in the prior year that demonstrates the earnings or the, the gross revenue, okay? So that's an important distinction because in, in a, an S corporation construct, so say you're an S corp and you have operating entities underneath, this is our situation at Hearts, um, you file one return because the S corp and its affiliates and, and, and subsidiaries all file a single tax return in the name of the S corp that's sitting on top. So if you're operating entities are underneath where, you, where your employees are, they don't file a separate tax return. There's no indication on the tax return that you file for the S Corp that any of these entities exist. So can you satisfy the requirement for that exemption of filing a tax return that shows the revenue with respect to the entity is a big question mark. And it's one of the questions we, we're going to be posing to FENSA. So that's a that's a reporting question that's that's unresolved at this point. But you have to but as going back to my first point, you have to start with the proposition that if you have an entity, it's a reporting company unless you satisfy a def the definition. Uh, so start there. Um, for existing entities, the first reporting deadline is January for uh, exist entities that existed before 2024. Your first reporting deadline is January 1, 2025. So you have to file your first beneficial ownership report by December 31st, 2025, uh, 2024, sorry. Um, for any entity that's formed this year, you have 90 days to file. So if you filed on January 1, you have to file your first report. If you, if you formed on January 1 or January 2nd, let's say, you, um, you have to file your first beneficial ownership report on April 1st. And to be clear, that's um, I, that's for new entities, not for new companies, right? So if a company forms a new entity, they file this year, right? Yes. Any any the the filing applies to whatever entity you submitted the formation document to the Secretary of State or equivalent, you know, this year. Um, so if you have an existing entity and you're forming a subsidiary entity under that this year, that subsidiary entity would have to report this year. The parent company would not have to report till the end of this year. Right. Um, I think this is a good moment to. I, I, I kind of like to do a little online poll. Just and I know we're not a scientific sampling of the small business community here today, but I'd like to get some sense of of who's on the line and what, and what kind of what you're facing here uh, with this. So, let's maybe put up the first question that we have uh, for folks and, and and get some responses. Um. So this is, you know, that 
Treasury says that a bunch of folks have already filed. So has anybody on the line filed? Let us know. We're still shifting a little bit here, so give it a second. All right. And if you Let's... if you dialed in with the I'm sorry I was just gonna say if you dialed in yeah. with the browser sometimes you can't access these polls so um, I, I do apologize if, if if that's happening to you but yeah I think we can go ahead and end it and All show right. the results done. So yeah, so six percent uh, um, have already filed, which which probably is high because we probably don't have a lot of new companies, but um, and uh, but the vast majority have, have not yet. So let's do the second question now. If we can, let's see uh, how many new companies, if any, we have here, or entities, as the case may be. I keep saying companies, but it's technically entities that have to file. All right, so we have some few fairly new companies, but technically no one, right, Tim, that actually has to. Uh, um, we have uh, three that started that are less than a year. Um, yeah. If they form their entity this year, they'd have to file uh, within 90 days. We all have to file by the end of this year. That's, you know, that's correct. I guess the key point. Everybody has to file by the end of the year, at least. Um, so, uh, and then... Quick question. So here's, my, here's, my, here's my question. Though. You have some folks who do, uh, there's nobody on the line who who had has to file now, but 6% of people have filed. Uh, do you think this is something, should people just get this out of the way and do it? Or what's your advice to folks on that regard? Well, I, I honestly think uh, you should wait as long as you can. Um, and I'll, and here's a few reasons why. Um, and, and I do want to get into these definitions. Um, because they're complicated and you may think you have complied by filing and you may not have mm -hmm. complied completely um, because the definition of beneficial owner is not just equity. It's uh, whoever participates in decision-making and, and participation in decision-making doesn't even have to be someone who has the power to make a decision or has a vote in the decision. It's just someone who may influence or play a significant role in the decision-making process. So there are a lot of questions about what that means. It's very uh, open-ended. And this is one of the reasons we challenged it because it's it's vague and endless. Um, the, the other point is that while the regulation caps the number of, of um, I'm blanking on the, term. So you have to report appli uh, applicants. So the people that actually form the entity, you get, you cap those that have to be reported to two people. All right. It's, you have to report the person that actually pressed the button to transmit the filing to the secretary of state. That's the one. And then you have to report the person inside the organization that, di that directed the filing as number two. Now, number one and two could be the same person. So you only have to report one person. But if you act, if you use an outside, if you if your law firm, for example, file, forms your entities for you, then whoever at the law firm transmitted the filing would have to be reported as an applicant, and then you know you as the business owner that directed it would also have, would be uh, reported as an applicant. Um, so the applicants are fairly straightforward. That's not where the problem is. The problem is on who is yeah. a beneficial owner. If you're the sole owner, or maybe you're with your spouse or family or partner or whoever, the and you you think you're the owners of the business, you may not be, right? You are because of the equity interest, but there may be a lot of other people. And the requirement under the statute and the final rule is that you have to report all beneficial owners. You don't get to stop. You don't get to say, oh, I have five I can identify. I'm just going to stop there. No, you have to complete the analysis for everybody that touches decision making in your organization. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, a lot of you probably have outside 
IT consultants that help set up your systems, um, help you identify what equipment to buy, um, and they and they service the equipment. They help you select software. Um, they may help you know load it or whatever. Uh, but but their recommendations form the basis of your decision to spend a lot of money on IT systems. Under the under the rule, they might be a beneficial owner of your company that has to be reported because they played a significant role in decision making about a major expenditure with respect to your company. And it may sound ridiculous, um, but the, the, the FinCEN is intending for this statute and the rule to have a far reaching effect because they're trying to get the king, the drug kingpins and the terrorist financiers or whatever who control everything behind the scenes, like the Wizard of Oz, is, they're pulling all the strings behind the curtains. Nobody sees them touching the entity itself. Um, someone else is a front person that's put in, in the entity directly, but the kingpin or the oligarch is pulling the strings in the background and not nothing on the surface uh, attaches the oligarch with the entity. Um, and so FinCEN's drafted these rules to try to reach that situation where there are unofficial relationships, either official or unofficial relationships that the entity has with other people that that influence how the what the entity does. Okay. So that's why I said at the outset that the concepts of control here are so far beyond the traditional notions of control that we have under corporate law and governance um, that you can't think about compliance with respect to the CTA um, in the traditional using the traditional definitions of ownership and control. This is a complete new paradigm mm -hmm. that really makes uh no sense um, right. for for the business community at all. Yeah. And, and I will say that this is one of our arguments in the federal court that that the uh, that the law is unconstitutionally vague in its definitions, uh, sp especially for beneficial ownership. Um, and I was there for the oral arguments, actually, for the lawsuit. <laughs> and this is this is this particular point clearly resonated with the judge. I mean, he he asked a lot of sharp questions of the Department of Justice about around this. Um, and so uh, it, it clearly was something that uh, he was very aware of. So I yeah. hope that I hope that's a good sign. We'll see. Yeah, um, exactly. The, the other thing I'll just point out is, um, you know, and I think I saw a couple comments to this point, and we made this point in the in the pleadings and, and the briefings to the court. You know, the criminals aren't going to report their their information into the system. The only people that are going to report their correct information or try to comply with this law are law abiding citizens or people that are trying to do the right thing. And so the reality of FinCEN getting information about the drug kingpin or the guy who's um, or the oligarch who's you know buying up New York real estate it's just it's a fallacy and we know this to be true because they have many many examples from the UK registry where the where the um, criminals just picked a name a real person and put it in all their filings and 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 the UK law enforcement agencies actually, when they started scurrying, scouring the information, they they thought they found a kingpin because this guy's name was associated with so many of these different organizations that we're seeing popping up here and there. And so I think they spent two years tracking this guy down and finding him. And and they finally go to his door and I don't know if they broke it down or whatever, but uh, it turns out that this guy had no idea his name was being used. He was completely innocent of anything. And it threw law enforcement off the trail for at least two years. Um, you know, so that's, that's just, that's how this is going to work. All of you on this call are going to do your best to comply and provide your beneficial ownership information to the saying, and, and you're all, you know, just trying to conduct legal business. Um, the people that aren't going to submit information are the um, are the criminals and their representatives right. who are tied to the entities that that law enforcement wants to go after. So it just it logically it makes no sense whatsoever. Yep. Well, um, 
the, the other issue, of course, is, and I, I think I see a few questions probably up in the chat about this, I guess we can address preemptively, and that is most small companies have never heard of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network that's part of, part of the Department of Treasury, so-called FinCEN. FinCEN has never really dealt with the small business community before, um, yet suddenly there's this need for folks to find out about FinCEN, for FinCEN to do outreach, which isn't really happening uh, to the small business community. Can you talk a little bit about that and what's, how are small companies supposed to find out that they even have this requirement? It's, it's unfortunate, but you know, FinCEN's done no, literally no outreach, uh, no public education. Um, it's been very limited. They had, I'm aware of one webinar they had, I tried to sign up for it and was told that it was oversubscribed and I couldn't get in. Um, so, and that's the only one I know of. They had it, I think I, they had it in November or December. I can't remember. Um, and, but other than that, you know, other than posting news um, press releases on their website and sending it out to the media, they've, they, as far as we know, they've done nothing. Um, they were supposed to, Congress authorized appropriations for um, outreach and education that was supposed to go to the states so that the Secretary of State's, the Secretary of State could notify filers, which makes sense, but Congress never actually appropriated the dollars. Um, right. So that money is not there and the states, to my knowledge, are not doing anything to educate uh, either. Um, so it's um, it's a real mess um, that this obligation, and mind you, failure to comply or willful um, failure to comply is punishable by two years in jail. Okay, so this is a felony if right. you mess up. Um, so this is not something to just say, oh, it's not a big deal. I'm just not going to file. If if Benson decides to actually enforce this thing, um, it could be a real problem uh, if you just are kind of willy nilly about it and and don't do your best to try to to um, provide the information that's required. Yeah, I've also heard some concern from small businesses and some attorneys that this could be kind of a wind up being a mechanism for a fishing expedition. Like the feds are trying to find out something else about your business. The first thing I'll go to is, have you filed, is there any, are there any mistakes on your fencing filings? And if there are, and there's a good chance there will be, they'll hold it over your head for some other reason entirely. Do you, do you see that danger? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just, the, the hold up value, say you have some, you know, tax issue, it's not a criminal thing, it's a civil action or some other, maybe the FTC, you know, or the al alcohol, you know, ATF has some, you know, you mislabeled your your wine label or something and they have an action against you um, and they are coming after you on that. And, you know, they, and you, you're you putting up resistance and then they say, well, let me go to see how, what you did on your, um, CTA filings and you have a mistake, now they can threaten you with jail. You know, if you have some other issue with the federal government that's civil in nature, they can always come into the CTA database and if they find a mistake, they can now hold that over your head and say, well, if you don't, you know, we're going to prosecute you for this violation under the CTA and you're going to go to jail if we win. Uh, so you better give, a, if you give us you know, what we want on this other issue, we'll, we'll call that even on the CTA or they'll just come after you and, and, and uh, try to put you, put the screws to you. So um, it's, it's not, you know, and this is just information, right? It's, this is not any activity you're engaged in, right? It's not like you're, you're, uh, you know, doing something in, commerce, right, um, that requires you to file, to provide this information. This is just the government saying, give me all this information about you personally. It has nothing to do with your business. It has nothing to do with commerce. It has nothing to do with regulation. But give me this personal information about you and the other people that influence your business. And we're going to keep it here. And if you make a mistake, I've got uh, criminal penalties waiting on the backside for you. Well, I think we all agree it's it's it's, it's pretty outrageous from the small business perspective. So um, I, I think we should you know, probably get to some uh, uh, questions. There's a bunch of them uh, that are out there. Uh, but first off, I kind of want to sort of 
give a sense of the path for the lawsuit. I mentioned before we expect a ruling any day. That no matter what the ruling is, that's not going to be the end of the issue. I think people should be aware of that. It's whoever wins this lawsuit, it's going to be appealed to the next level. Uh, and I think there's a very good chance uh, that this will wind up in front of the Supreme Court. That's going to take some time. And so whether there are stays or, or not uh, uh, will affect whether or not people actually have to file in December uh, of this year. Um, so you really, it's something you've got to stay, stay tuned to because it's going to be an evolving process um, uh, as, as this goes ahead. Um, do, you, do, do you see any, uh, uh, any other forecasts for what could happen from the court's perspective? Uh, Tim? Yeah, no, I think you, you said it right. Uh, we're committed, um, and Todd and, and all of you through the NSBA has committed to appeal if we lose at the district court. Um, if we if we then also lose at the appellate court, we'll have to make a decision whether we want to take it to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, if we win at the district court, we're, high to, we're confident that the, the government is going to appeal, and, I, and we're confident that they will appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. I think what we've discussed uh, with Todd and your leadership is that if we if we have a victory in either the district court or the appellate court, we'll, we will then go to the Supreme Court. Um, if we have a if we lose at both levels, we we have a decision to make. Um, but um, you know, as Todd indicated, we we thought we had a very good day before the judge at the hearing, um, and we're hopeful that. Um, he, he comes to the right conclusion from our yeah. perspective, obviously. And, and and also, we don't know why he hasn't ruled, and there's really no way to know. <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the federal courts that were a little bit of a black box. So um, if we had it's insight, right. we would yeah. show it. But... I, I will say that there, we threw a lot of law at, the, at him. Yes. We probably had eight different constitutional uh, claims um, for uh, invalidating the statute. And so he has to get through all of those and, and these constitutional this and a lot of these are first impression like there, there's never been a case there's never been a statute like this before right so it, he he it's it's a lot of work that he has to get through um and we want him you know whether he rules with us or against us we want to have a really strong decision or you know a, a comprehensive decision so that either we can help support it or attack it you know uh, in either way, we want him to be as thorough as possible. Um, so it's it, de it definitely has taken longer than we expected. But the more I reflect on it, I think it's understandable. And also you factor in the holiday schedule as well. Uh, that probably um, delayed things. Yeah. So Molly, do you want to get a few questions from folks? I think there's a bunch. Yeah, there there are quite a few. I'm going to start with the ones that were emailed in over the last week or so. Um, are there any initiatives or government support programs in place to assist small businesses in understanding and complying with the CTA requirements? Zero. Um, the, the only thing that exists is what FinCEN is publishing. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to go to the FinCEN website. They have a page that's specifically dedicated to beneficial ownership reporting. And what you'll get there is links to the statute. Um, you'll get links to the regulations. But uh, FinCEN has developed uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, they've developed a small business compliance guide um, and other materials like that. Um, that'll be not fun for you to read through, but I think it's essential that you take the yeah. time to do it. Um, I, should, I should say we have a we have a slide design that we're, we'll put out and send out to everybody after at the conclusion that has yeah. all those links and everything on it, so you'll yeah. have all that. But otherwise, it's been literally left to organizations like NSBA and and one I'm I'm technically a member of the NSBA, but uh, another one I I belong to the Private Investor Coalition. You know, we're basically taking the initiative um, to educate our members about these requirements because nobody else is. Um, you have a lot of law firms out there that are publishing, you know, their uh, newsletters or or bulletins about the CTA and the compliance requirements. But th it, that just goes on the web. They're not, you know, some of them are reaching out to their clients directly. Um, but that outreach is, has really been limited. Um, and now that every, now that the compliance obligation is on us. You know, we have to, and I would encourage you if you have friends that are in business or whatever, 
um, let them know that this is out there because you know the penalties for non-compliance are very severe. Um, the civil penalty for non-compliance is now five hundred ninety-one dollars per day, up to uh, ten thousand um, dollars in the aggregate for each violation, and then also the two-year uh, criminal penalty of jail time uh, also can attach. So um, it can, the penalties get steep very quickly. Great. The next question, we've seen a couple versions of it. I um, want a couple on the chat and then somebody uh, emailed it in as well. Uh, talking about employees. So you know, while you may be the owner, the only stockholder, if your employees have a lot of control and influence and you make decisions together, do you have to report on them? It's all facts and circumstances specific, but um, let me just um, let me just read. It's a little complicated, but um, so the FinCEN uh, defines substantial control as anyone who has substantial influence over over important decisions with your company, um, and. They say it's anyone who directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions made by the reporting company, including decisions regarding the nature, scope, and attributes of the business, um, reorganization, dissolution, merger. This is the big one. Uh, major expenditures or investments, issuances of equity, incurrence of any debt or approval of the operating budget of the reporting company. Um, selection of or termination of business lines or ventures compensation schemes and incentive programs for senior officers. Um, and then they have the catch-all or has any other form of substantial control over the reporting company. They then go on to say that, and this is verbatim, the final rule also retains the quote unquote substantial influence language because FinCEN envisions situations in which individuals may not have the power to direct or determine important decisions made by the reporting company but may play a significant role in the decision-making process and outcomes with respect to those important decisions. Okay, so this, so anybody who plays a significant role in your decision-making process is a beneficial owner of your company. So if you have a research analyst, if you have a sales guy, uh, you may have a technician who is reporting up the chain that, hey, we're having these issues with these problems, uh, we're gonna need to spend some money to fix them, or there's a suggestion that we, maybe it's even a suggestion, you know, we have an opportunity to, to bring in new business if we host a conference, right? Somewhere or a training session somewhere in the country. Um, that person making that suggestion, did they play, you, got, you tell me, did they play a significant role in the decision-making to actually host that conference or put it on or put on the training session? If you have an analyst inside your organization who prepares or somebody else who prepares a report on which senior leadership makes a decision, did they play a significant role? Now that's just inside the organization. Let me take you to another sphere. Say you have a mentor, say you have an advisory committee, okay? Say you have um, a, you know, your banker who you don't, you're not getting a loan from him, but you talk to him about your financial situations and you take his advice or her advice, you know, frequently. Does it, has that person played a significant role in your decision-making? This is, this is the slippery slope that we're dealing with here. Um, and mind you, you have to report all beneficial owners. If you make a discretionary, this is, uh, this is me as a lawyer talking and how I think about it for my organization. If I make a discretionary determination that this person is not a beneficial owner because I don't think this, the role is significant enough, that's a subjective determination, right? Benson can always come and say, well, you, you, that was subjective and you're wrong. We think this person is a beneficial owner and you violated the statute. And then I'm also thinking as a lawyer, well, if I made that decision on a discretionary basis, that's willful, right? I mean, that I did that on purpose, thinking I was doing it right. So does that now mean it was a willful violation of the statute and I now may go to jail? The, these are the dicey nuances of this legislation and the final rule that I'm struggling with. I have 
you know, I'm not a small business here. We're a multi-billion dollar organization, but, and I, and we have hundreds of employees, right? But I have probably, we're a real estate business. So I have, you know, we have a, new, a separate entity for almost every asset we own. Um, I have over 400 entities, right? I may have three or four that will satisfy the large operating company exemption. So I'm going to be reporting over 400 reporting companies and the owners of those, the beneficial owners of those reporting companies. And imagine what my slate of officers, I have a finance department, we have a legal department, we have accounting, payroll, I mean, benefits. I mean, how many people inside my organization am I going to have to report? I haven't figured it out yet. But I'm I not. Say, I, I will say, when this came up in the, I mentioned this before. That I mean, some people think, well, maybe this is ridiculous. No one's ever going to interpret the law this way. That's crazy. Those aren't decision makers. I will tell you, in in the federal court, when this came up, the judge told the Department of Justice he was reflecting back on his days in a small law firm that would have had to report. He said they had eighteen. I think it was eighteen people in the company. Only half of them were lawyers. But he thought everybody in the company was a significant decision maker. He said if they were used back in that firm and this law came up, he would report every single person in the company as a beneficial owner um, because right. he thinks the, the law is written that broadly. And the smaller your organization, the more likely it is that everybody is plays a significant role, right? So that's what you're looking at. And then it's not just inside your organization. As I said before, you have to look outside in your relationships outside the organization and who may have an influence on your on your business, right? On your decision making processes. And the statute says you have to look at every contract, every relationship, every affiliation. Let me get the exact language. Um, beneficial owner means with respect to an entity, an individual who directly or indirectly through any contract, arrangement, understanding, relationship or otherwise exercises substantial control over the entity. And remember, substantial control could be significant influence. So now, I, if you say I have to look at all my contracts and who exercise, plays a significant role in my decision making, one of the first examples I throw out is my landlord, right? I, that Your lease is a contract. The landlord, you know, say you're building out new space, the landlord's obvious you know, a lot of times very intimately involved in, you know, where are you going to put doors, where are you going to put walls, where are you going to, you know, what kind of finishes you're going to have. Those all go to your budget and decision making around your expenditures. So technically, to me, the, you know, your landlord could be a beneficial owner of your company. Because that's what the statute says. And that's how the, you know, it's been interpreting it. So um, this is this is why I'm encouraging everybody to wait as long as possible. We are, I have, um, you know, we've been working with Todd and other organizations. You know, we have a, a laundry list of questions, these kinds of clarifications where we're gonna say, do you really mean that, uh, you know, a spouse that has pillow talk with the other spouse about the business, is that gonna make her or him or her, uh, you know, a beneficial owner, right? And I have to start reporting my spouse. You know, they, they there was there were two instances where Vincent gave relief, and that was in the following for outside advisors. They only provided in the context of accountants and lawyers in arm's length transactions, in arm's length arrangements. So my wife has had a couple of businesses that, and I do did all the paperwork for it. You know, I, so I did set up the entities, I you know did the contracts, you know the leases, you know all that stuff. And but I have no ownership interest in these businesses. I do it because she's my wife, you know, and, um, you know, under this definition, even even though I was providing legitimate legal services to her, I didn't get paid for it. Right. So that's not arm's length. And yeah. so technically, I think I would have to be reported as a beneficial over owner of my wife's company, even though I have no formal role in that business. So these are the kinds of relationships that you sort of have to think about that exist outside the four corners of your business and the governance documents that FinCEN is intentionally trying to get at. 
Okay. They are specifically trying to get these informal relationships that influence your business activities. So, so if you think they're going to be gracious in, in ignoring a misstep in your filing, I would not put any confidence in that because this is the exact type of relationship that they're going after. They're going after the people that are hiding in the shadows. Great. Um, I, I know we're running a little short on time, so we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can. Um, there there was a question, are there any industries that have a blanket exemption, i.e. if you're in the financial or financial services industry? Yeah, any regulated entity. So uh, public companies are exempt. Registered investment advisors are exempt. Investment companies are exempt. Insurance companies are exempt. So just think of any, any industry that's regulated. Re regulated or where you have to register with the federal government to operate in that industry, you're out. Okay. Um, as it are non, uh, nonprofit, not, uh, you know, exempt um, entities under 501c. And then any subsidiaries of an exempt entity are also exempt. So you said insurance companies, would that include insurance agencies? as well? I believe so, yes. There is um, th there is a specific exemption for insurance producers. Um, I haven't, I'm not in that space, so I don't understand, necessarily understand all the nuances, but there is this, there is an express exemption for insurance. Um, so I would just look at that particular one, have your attorney uh, help you with that. And just, if you can squeeze into that, great. But remember, it, if you, if you, a lot of you may have ancillary entities that maybe you, maybe you have, you own your building that you're in or something like that. And you put the building in a different entity, right. To hold the, the real estate asset. Um, so that entity may, will not be exempt, even though you're in primary insurance and even uh, unless it's wholly owned subsidiary, not wholly owned, but you know, unless it's a subsidiary or qualifies for the subsidiary exemption, that it, that other real estate entity will not be exempt. And the other thing to think about, too, is like if you're in that situation where you have outside partners that may have co-invested in the real estate asset, um, even if you're an exempt entity, that the, they may not be exempt on their own and they still have to re be reported as a beneficial owner of that real estate entity if the real estate entity is not exempt. Kind of along those lines, Tim, uh, another question just came in asking about um, federal contractors. So if you're registered with SAM, um, are, is that included? That So that doesn't cover what you're talking no. about? No. Okay. No. Okay. It's not, it's not every, um, these are, these are, it's not a, basically where you have to do a registration to do business with the federal government. It's where you are actually regulated by the federal government in some form or fashion. Okay. Uh, directly. Okay. Um, I'm also going to answer a bunch of questions uh, that I don't want to miss getting to about who ultimately has the liability here. Uh, the entity, the company, the every single beneficial owner. Who's who's on the hook for these potential fines and uh, uh, jail time? It depends on who's responsible for the failure to comply. Okay. So first line will be the, the, the senior executive decision makers of the reporting company itself. Um, say you have, say you have, um, you know, a couple investors, you have, you know, you, you're the primary business owner, you run everything, but you had some, maybe you, you borrowed money or, or your family or friends invested in your company. They own, you know, 5%, 10% or whatever, but they're not involved. You're just paying them back or, you know, they get a cut of the distributions, um, and so if they are 25% or more, then they're a beneficial owner. If they are involved in any decision-making, they're a beneficial owner. Um, and you have to report them. Now, say they say, I'm not reporting, I'm not giving you my information. I'm not going to, you know, forget it. I'm not doing it. In that case where you make a good faith effort to get the information, you're probably off the hook. But that individual will be liable. 
the, the beneficial owner himself who refuses to comply and provide beneficial ownership information would be liable. If you never ask for the information uh, or don't want to be bothered to ask, maybe you had a falling out or something like that, then you're going to be liable. Okay. Um, we've got a couple people asking, you know, if, if they're consultants and this is kind of a bigger, you, I, you know, you talked a little bit about talking to your wife about stuff, Tim. Um, so if you're a consultant, you're helping all these businesses, what exactly do you need to be doing right now? I mean, what, what's your role in this? Yeah. So uh, the consultant will have to look at this for their own business, for their own consulting practice itself. Right. Um, but to the extent that you're working with others, you know, your job is consulting with small businesses about, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have a duty to tell them about the CTA and their compliance obligation, but I, I would think as a part of your, you know, your relationships and your constituent or not constituent, but customer relations or whatever, you would want to tell them that this is, this is here and they need to pay attention to it. Okay. I know there's a lot of questions that are coming in. I, I think we're doing our best to answer as much as we can. Uh, unfortunately, there's so many questions that, uh, that we don't know either. So I think that's really why Tim and Todd are encouraging folks to wait till the end of the year. Um, like Tim said, he's got a, a pretty extensive list of questions he's he's sending in defense then. So um, this is certainly not the last one of these conversations we're gonna have. Uh, so if we didn't get to your question, um, feel free to send it to me or to Ian and we'll do our best to answer it. Um, just know that a, a lot of it's really vague and, and we may not be able to. Um, are, are there, Tim and Todd, are there, I know you've been watching the chat, are there any other questions we want to get to before we jump over to the call to action section? I feel like we've hit the main ones, Tim. Is that something you're saying that you think need answering? Yeah, and I, th I think, um, I think I've emphasized the point of, the, you know, just determining who a beneficial owner is, is where all the problem exists with the statute and where you, everybody's going to get tripped up. And so just please pay attention to it. Um, you're going to have to get counsel to help you. And I think that helps, you know, having counsel, I know it's expensive, but having, and, and the part of the problem is a lot of your attorneys may not even know about this yet, uh, depending on the, right. the firms you use. So, you know, they're going to have to learn, they need to get up to speed. Um, and it's just going to be, this is just going to be difficult there. Are, what I'll say is there, um, there's been as, Todd mentioned, and this is where we'll get into the call to action. There, uh, a delay bill has been has passed the House. Um, there's one pending in the Senate. We understand that um, it got fast tracked, but there was at least on the Democratic side, at least one senator objected um, to it being voted on, and so that put stalled it. We're trying to find out who that is now, uh, but we're trying if we can get a delay bill through that'll give us another year to deal with some of these issues, but um, that's just a delay. And, you know, we're, we're starting to get some traction with with uh, certain members of Congress on how um, sort of oppressive this regime is. And, um, but I, I still think even with all that, it's a heavy road to hoe, so, or long road to hoe. So it's, I just think, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do our best, but I think, you know, CTA is here unless we can stop it legally with this constitutional challenge. I we're going to be living with this at some point, uh, whether we yeah. delay or not. I think a delay is is the minimum we should expect, but uh, that may not be forthcoming. Yeah, the, the, the delay bill, as you said, the House already passed one. The Senate it could come up next week, so um, maybe not. But the, we're certainly pushing for that. But this is also why I encourage all of you to reach out to your to your members of Congress, senators and House members to talk to them about this. I mean, we're up on the hill all the time talking to people. And it's amazing. Uh, even for places that have heard of this, their first reaction is, what's the big deal? You just you just got to send in your, you know, your name and your address for your company. You're the business owner, send it in, and you're done. And they don't in any way appreciate the minefield they've created with these definitions right. of beneficial owners and all the rest of it. They just don't get it. Um, and when they do, they, their eyes are beginning to open and realizing they've they've kind of messed up here. But it's going to take an educational campaign. It's going to take business owners back home saying, 
what's this thing that you've done to open some eyes? Because right now those eyes still aren't fully open. Um, they just think, you know, maybe Fenton's not quite ready to take the database, so maybe we'll delay for a year. But they're still not quite there and realizing that, that they really screwed up. And I think it's going to take education from back home. And that's not just calling them directly. You know, if you want to try to pin an op-ed to your local paper, do social media posts, talk to other organizations that you might be a part of, make sure they're aware of this. They're talking to their members about it. Um, we've really got to spread the word far and wide. I mean, I mean, we're, we're doing our best, you know, that we have, you know, of course, many thousands of companies involved in SBA, but there are millions of companies in the USA overall. Uh, and we've got to find a way to engage uh, a, a good chunk of them to really get this this change. That's where you all, I think, yeah, come in. Um, so, Molly, let's let's. I mean, I, you know, people have been asking about where do I go? How do I find more space? A good time to sort of put up that um, uh, information for folks. And again, we'll be sending this out to everybody. Um, the other thing I'll, I will mention is uh, in SBA we have uh, sort of done a sweep of uh, companies that that can at least help. Uh, small businesses with their reporting obligations. And again, we're not sure you should do it right away, but but we've partnered with uh, Walters Kluwer. We think they're a really good company that can that can uh, help you sort of step through the filing process and, and ask the right questions, figure out even if you, uh, they have a whole guide and figure out if you're even, uh, if you're exempt or not. So they have a sort of a, 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 a decision tree to go through on their website, which I think is really useful. I'd encourage everyone to, uh, to do that. Uh, also, here's you know, the, the, the FinCEN site is here, uh, FinCEN.gov slash BOI, and that's where you'll find the, uh, the various compliance guides, the very robust, thick, multi-page compliance guides <laughs> that still leave you confused. But I still think it's something you need to look at and deal with and, and think about. Take to your take to your lawyers and advisors. Um, so uh, 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 that's the shape of things. I I I wish we had a better news, but I but I but I'm really glad we're able to um, provide you the information and make sure yeah. that you're aware of what's going on out there. So, um, you know, Todd, can I other, just bring up one other point um, real quick? So, um, FinCEN, uh, one positive thing they did in this is they created this uh, what's called a FinCEN ID. So you can apply as a beneficial owner to get a, a FinCEN ID for yourself. Um, for if you just have your own business, it may not be a big deal, but, uh, I look at, you know, my organization where I have many hundreds of entities I have to report on, I have, I don't know, tens of beneficial owners that I'm going to have to report, um, you know, that includes owners and executives and other people inside the organization. Um, I will be getting fence and IDs for everybody. And here's why. So the database, so every reporting company that you provide beneficial ownership information for, you have to report each beneficial owner's personal information for each reporting company. But if you get a FinCEN ID for a, a ben particular beneficial owner, then when you're making that report for each of those uh, re reporting companies, you only have to provide the FinCEN ID of that beneficial owner. So say the beneficial owner is a beneficial owner of five companies. Um, you report the FinCEN ID five times. You don't report the, fin the personal information five times. You only report the personal information yeah. once when you applied for the FinCEN ID in the first place for that beneficial owner. And if you think about privacy, data privacy and data security, that becomes important because it, it, I fully expect that this FinCEN database is going to be hacked by somebody. FinCEN's already been hacked in a major way for their uh, suspicious activity reports. Um, but if you only have one entry for yourself in that database, that's going to be a lot better than having five entries of your personal information or 20 entries. Um, you know, I have or I may have 400 entries for myself. I don't want that. You know, if I can just have one entry for my my fence and ID and my fence and ID shows up 400 times, Okay, that's a lot better than my personal information showing up 400 times. Now, databases can be scrubbed and scraped, and they'll probably get my personal information either way. But you know, the trick with data privacy is you know don't be the low hanging fruit. So um, the least, the smallest footprint you can have in that database, the better. So as you're as you're looking at your compliance with 
with this database, you look at the FinCEN ID, you, you sign up for it the same place that you file the, the uh, beneficial ownership reports. But I think that's just a, a smart way to manage your attachment to the database. I, I did want to highlight, if I, I could quickly, I know we, we're going to try and end the call um, quite quite soon. Um, I did post in the chat our action alert, um, but if, if you also go to nsba.biz slash CTA, we have a ton of information there, the action alerts there. And when I say action alert, it's a, a quick letter that you can send up to your members of Congress, up to your senators, your representatives. Um, it's very easy. You just have to put in your name, personalize a couple of, bit of bits of information in there. should take less than two minutes. You can also use that for talking points. If you want to make phone calls, we certainly encourage that. That. Um, so if, uh, like I said, if you weren't able to get these links uh, when we showed up the slide, we will send that all to you after the call. But it's also at nsba.biz slash CTA. That's a really good place for any kind of new information on CTA. So yep. check there for, for details. So sorry, sorry yep. about that, Todd, back to you. Yeah. And Todd, before no, you, you close, I, just, yes, the, I do want to say that we are, we're going to continue the fight. I see a lot of comments popping up. We're continuing the fight. I think the most important place we can have an impact is in the lawsuit. Um, we've asked for a national injunction of the statute. If we went at the district court, it will stop this thing, cold turkey. And if that happens, we'll be in a much better position to go to Congress and say, you guys got to do it. You got to start over. You got to stop and start over. Um, there's a much more, uh, there's a much easier way to do this, which is to piggyback off of the CDD rule that we talked about before. Um, and what's 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 crazy about the CDD rule is FinCEN and Treasury exempted real estate and law firms and escrow firms from having to be covered by the CDD rule. So um, that's why you had, if you remember the Panama Papers and some of these other things where the law firms were the ones actually um, processing and closing these transactions for the drug kingpins and the oligarchs without their fingerprints on it. Um, and and that came out, I mean, how many years ago were the Panama Papers? Like 15, 20 years now? And they never right, closed right. the loophole. You know, but they're now they're putting this big burden on small businesses because they're too afraid to close the loophole with law firms or real estate industry. So it's just crazy. Um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to make the point. We're continuing the fight. We're going to try to stop this in its tracks. That's why, you know, I applaud Todd and the NSBA leadership for stepping up and being the lead plaintiff on this lawsuit. Nobody else is doing it. It's you guys, your membership. Um, and so I applaud you guys for doing it. We're going to keep going as long as we can. And hopefully we'll have a victory here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I hope so. Let's let's all keep our fingers crossed. And it'll be a little longer after that. But if, if the ruling is the right one, it'll at least give us a little bit of breathing room and maybe go back to the drawing board to get this law right. So thank you all for joining us. I know you have a bunch more questions. I think we'll probably, uh, maybe after the lawsuit, as after the ruling, maybe we'll do another one of these like this again to give you all an update um, and as things move forward. Uh, so thank you for all that you do and all that you will do on this and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye.